Watch this. New year, new you did what? Idaho's lieutenant governor has a new budget to play with with the start of the new fiscal year. And she decided to upgrade an employee and more significantly, their salary. We've all been feeling the pinch at the register for months, but now it's officially official. Inflation. It's the highest it's been in 40 years. You know, a big driver of that is what allows us to drive and helps bring products to market. The price of gas, which has a lot of people calling for more oil drilling. But is anyone listening? You know, part of the responsibility of being an elected official, from school board trustee to county sheriff to state lawmaker, is you're expected to use taxpayer money wisely. We should all expect that since it's all of our money they are working with, despite having more than a billion dollar surplus right now to work with here in the state of Idaho. And the beauty of it is we can see where all of it is spent right down to the penny. Governmental agencies and elected officials are required by law to outline a budget, get that budget approved, and then stick to it. If they don't, well, we usually learn about it in the name of transparency. Well, something has been happening with the lieutenant governor's budget lately that has been a continual talking point and has a lot of people asking questions. It began with a lost lawsuit and covering those fines and court costs from her $205,000 budget, which left her without enough money to pay staff and taking home a final paycheck of the last fiscal year of just $20.20 and leaving 72 cents in her office budget. Well, that last fiscal year ended the first of this month. And it seems the lieutenant governor is making up for lost money. Public records show Lieutenant Governor Janice McGeehan gave a significant pay bump to the only person left on her staff, Michelle Hamilton, and she gave her the title of Director of Strategy and Constituent Services. We're talking 30,000 more than her last full-time employee for a lame duck role. Thus the questions, is this raise abnormal? Is it legal? Here's Chief Political Reporter Joe Paris with some answers. The lieutenant governor position in Idaho is technically a part-time position. Last fiscal year, Janice McGeehan made about $48,000. Under state code, the lieutenant governor can only make 35% of what the governor makes. But there's nothing in Idaho code that says her staff can't earn more than she does. Financial information obtained through public records show that McGeehan gave a $57,000 raise to her only employee, Michelle Hamilton. Hamilton was previously a part-time employee. She had her hourly wage go from $20 an hour to about $37 an hour, or about $77,000 for a year. Her title also changed. Hamilton is now officially listed in state records as the Director of Strategy and Constituent Services for the Lieutenant Governor's Office. For perspective, McGeehan's former Chief of Staff was paid about $47,000 a year. He resigned back in March of this year as the lieutenant governor's office worked to balance their budget after unexpected court costs in their battle with the Idaho Press Club over releasing public records. We reached out to Lieutenant Governor McGeehan to ask if that position comes with expanded responsibilities compared to the previous chief of staff, but no response just yet. The raise also prompts questions as to why Hamilton got the raise and who approved the amount. So how does the budget for a constitutional officer like the lieutenant governor work? A spokesperson for the Idaho Division of Financial Management tells us that, quote, constitutional officers are afforded discretion in hiring and salary decisions, meaning neither DFM nor the Division of Human Resources are required to approve personnel decisions from the lieutenant governor's office. The Idaho legislature approved $205,000 for the 2022-2023 fiscal year budget for the lieutenant governor's office. That runs from July 1st to June 30th. How the lieutenant governor spends that money is basically up to her, as outlined in state code, Title 67, Chapter 8. The only current limitation for the office when it comes to hiring and pay is the cap of three full-time positions. Only one is filled right now. An intricacy here is that McGeehan's budget will roll over into the hands of the new lieutenant governor in January. That winner will be determined in the November general election. Hypothetically, if McGeehan does draw too much from the lieutenant governor's budget, the incoming lieutenant governor would inherit any possible issues. There are also questions about the relationship between McGeehan and Hamilton. Critics argue the raise is a reward for a close political ally and friend. Supporters say those circumstances are irrelevant to the position. 
Hamilton, working in the background here during a KTVB interview with McGeehan, is the first vice chairman of the Idaho Republican Party and seeking a second term. We reached out to McGeehan and stopped by her office to ask about the raise and the criticisms behind the use of taxpayer funds. No response yet, but McGeehan did take to social media to address the story. She writes, quote, Once again, we see the establishment politicians and the media up to their old tricks. They told you my office budget wasn't balanced, but it was. Now they're trying to manufacture a controversy about my staffing for the remainder of the year. But why bring it up this week? So let's talk some intricacies here. The reality is that it's very unlikely that the full amount, amount Hamilton is slated to earn will actually be paid out because McGeehan only has through the end of the calendar year to serve as the lieutenant governor. She didn't run for another term. Instead, she ran for governor, which she did lose to current governor Brad Little in the May primary. Now, the budget can be fixed if there are any problems next year. When lawmakers get back to Boise in January, JFAC, which is the budgeting committee at the State House, they can request or, and consider some mid-year supplemental appropriations if an office asks for one and says we need more money. They consider that. Doesn't mean it's going to be a yes or a no. Now, it's hard to say for now if that will be needed. Another implication was made by the lieutenant governor saying that the press and critical politicians of her work are working to impact Hamilton's run for another term as the first vice chairman of the Idaho Republican Party. Brian, there's a big weekend coming up in Idaho Falls. The Idaho GOP is going to have uh, their, their big conference, as they do every summer. And part of that is they're going to be deciding who's going to be the leadership uh, within the Idaho Republican Party. We know that there's a divide in, within the Republican Party between what you would say more moderate moderate Republicans and more, I guess, far right would be the, 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 the name that is popular these days. Sure. But at the bottom line here is that if there is a problem with the lieutenant governor's budget rolling into next year, whoever the lieutenant governor is next year will have to deal with that. However, you also could argue from the lieutenant governor's perspective that instead of having three employees splitting $77,000, yeah. she just has one employee getting that money. Um, the questions, though, still continue about her relationship with Hamilton. Yeah. And we'd love to talk to the lieutenant governor. So as we say here on the 208, if you're watching, lieutenant governor, we'd love to talk to you about this. Love to hear from you, yes. And it's also interesting to point out that uh, this weekend you're talking about in Twin Falls, there's that question. But it could be when she says, why are we talking about this week? It could be that, well, maybe the fiscal year just started 13 or 10 days ago, yeah. 12 days ago. Just timing, how it works out. All right, thank you very much, Joe. You know, we may not have heard from Lieutenant Governor McGeehan on her new hire. We have been hearing from a lot of other politicians sending out a lot of statements today, all because the U.S. Bureau of Labor Statistics published the most recent inflation figures. And guess what? It keeps going up. Over the last 12 months, the Consumer Price Index says we are paying 9.1% more for everything. It's the highest inflation rate the U.S. has seen since the end of 1981. Back when Ronald Reagan was wrapping up his first year as president, you could buy a pound of bacon for $1.20, and a dozen eggs would cost you less than a dollar. 9.1% is a certain strain on our economy for sure, but what about or how about is it hitting Idahoans? Here's Andrew Bartline. <laughs> I look at the meeting with a friend at a coffee shop. Yeah. Right. It's a small luxury Connie Schroeder enjoys. We live a frugal lifestyle. It's also a comfortable lifestyle. Connie's retired. Her home is paid off. She usually rides a bike. When she does drive, it's a hybrid. I feel I was really pretty lucky at the times when we were working and uh, things were really quite stable economically for a long time. Despite her stroke of luck, Connie says that stability in the economy is fading. It's really very unfair for young people. Uh, they often carry such student loan debt and then the houses are so expensive. This is a reality recent college grad Allison Schaefer lives through every day. It seems like everything around me is increasing in price except wages. Schaefer has to rely on others just to afford the cost of living. I don't want to live without roommates, but I feel like I should be able to if I wanted to. The world just feels like it's burning around me. So the ability of the average worker to buy goods and services is declining. According to Idaho State Associate Economic Professor Carl Geisler, three factors drive the inflation rate we see today. The first he calls demand pull, which is when more dollars are chasing the same number of goods. The second he calls cost push. This is when businesses charge more simply because they can. The third he calls generous corporate rounding. Geisler says this driving factor is unconventional. If you're large enough and you've got significant market share in your industry, uh, some of those firms are adding a little bit on top of what they're already doing. 
So that's why corporate profits have been higher than usual over the last several months, even adjusted for inflation. Over the last year, the consumer price index shows inflation is at the highest rate since 1981. The average cost of all items over the past year increased 9.1 percent. Certainly, of course, gasoline, but I also notice it in the food. Like all utilities increased, that added on. And Idaho Senator Mike Crapo chimed in. He wasted no time this morning blaming President Biden. The president needs to stop looking for excuses and start focusing on the right kinds of policies that my colleagues have described here in terms of fixing and addressing the inflation crisis. Is it as simple as just blaming the president, the administration needs to figure this out, or is it more nuanced than that? Presidents get too much credit when the economy does well, and they get too much blame when the economy goes sideways. That's because energy is the main driving factor of the inflation we live with today. The CPI shows energy costs increased by 41.6% over the last year. According to Geisler, the inflation rate has actually lowered since March if you discount volatile anomalies, including energy. So whether it's a key ingredient like oil going directly into making plastics, or if you're just using energy to move components and final goods around the country, energy is a critical cost that really pushes other prices up. Geisler says the cost of oil is dictated by a global economy. And there isn't a lot we can do, as our society is highly dependent on oil. Geisler doesn't expect cost push inflation to disappear. If you know we want to get away from kind of this um, oil-driven inflation cycle, we need to do something about moving our economy further away from uh, from the use of fossil fuels. It wasn't Connie's plan originally. It's, oh my gosh! It's but she's already followed Geisler's suggestions for her personal life. So even the gas prices are not affecting us so much. Even though she recognizes it took a little luck to get there. It's hard to give advice in these uncertain times. Um, I, my life has been easier than many of the people of today, I think. Geisler says the Federal Reserve could raise interest rates to slow inflation because that would naturally lower demand. He says the Reserve is following that path. It could provide some relief for at least one of these three inflation factors he's identified. And we know that Senator Crapo has also put forth some suggestions today. And, and his argument is supply and demand. That's what we talked about in this press briefing. If the United States has supplies more oil, then we can get closer to meeting demand, and that should solve some of these problems. That is a whole can of worms to dig into, and I know you did some work on that today, and Brian. I'll get to that in just a quick second, but I want to draw attention to that, what uh, Geisler says, the generous corporate rounding. We kind of talked about this, <laughs> that, that basically, if something is charged or costing $5, they can be like, well, let's just charge 6 because, oh, man, inflation, whoo, and it's a, just get away with it because, I, I, I guess, because they can afford to or because, as they said, they're large enough in the market it's just what they do. Yeah, the layman term you hear a lot is corporate greed. You know, yeah. you can charge five ninety for something. Well, why not just round up to six bucks? It's not like somebody's not going to buy something over those ten cents. If you own a big market share, boy, that ten cents adds up, and you're going to make a lot of money. That's true. All right, thank you, Andrew. Great breakdown there. So, speaking of that, and the price of everything going up because of the price of gas, there's another element to this inflation angle mentioned during Senator Crapo's press conference. The price of gas and how it is affecting the price of everything else that like we just said. There are those on the dais today that seem to have a simple solution. We could create more good jobs across America and bring down the price of gasoline at the pump and provide a, some real relief uh, to American consumers if we would just uh, produce more energy here at home. What we want to do is help on the supply side of the economy, including producing more fossil fuels here in this country and all forms of energy in order for us to see the price go down at the pump and, and the utility bills go down. Yeah, there's been a small tick down in the gas prices, but they are still the major driving force here, and they're still above $5 a gallon. I think the answer is the president needs to stop looking for excuses and start focusing on the right kinds of policies that my colleagues have described here. Senator Crapo said the policies of producing more product, right, which Senator Crapo and his colleagues say runs contradictory to the current administration. So who's to blame in all this? Remember back in March when President Biden and his press secretary, Jen Psaki, said the onus is on the oil industry to get to drilling because there were more than 9,000 oil leases out there on federal land just being unused. And they could have been doing some drilling, any onshore, onshore drilling at any time up to that point. Well, that's true. At the end of last year, there were 9,173 approved and available permits to drill on federal lands. In fact, it's common 
for there to be thousands of unused permits, no matter who's in the Oval Office, according to the Independent Petroleum Association of America. But it's not as simple as have permit, pull out the oil. There's a lot that has to happen. Companies have to get permits to drill for that oil, then hire the people to do that drilling. And none of this happens within a work week. It could take months to years because of the complex local permitting requirements and the possible construction of infrastructure such as pipelines and storage facilities. And that rec could require securing rights of way with state and private landowners. There's a whole lot that goes into this. One study found the world's largest oil and gas fields averaged five and a half years to go from discovery to first production. And then it took 17 years of production on average to reach peak output. It's a lot of time. There's also the cost of doing it that these days with worker and supply shortages still plaguing well everyone since early in the pandemic and also who knows what's really under there you could go through all that drilling all that time and money for nothing but then there's the other incentive to not drill even if you're sitting on proven reserves and you're a for-profit company relying on and reporting to investors why not just hold on to that lease and that reserve as a way to attract investors for future dividends or even current ones You've heard about the record profits being made by major oil companies these days, right? After losing $76 billion two years ago because of the pandemic bust, according to the Center for American Progress, the five major oil companies' first quarter profits totaled more than $35 billion in just three months. Wouldn't increasing that supply decrease those profits? Oh, and by the way, we are drilling. Back in 2018, we became the world's top producer of oil. And prior to the pandemic, U.S. oil production hit an all-time high, pulling out just shy of 13 million barrels a day. The most recent data available from the Energy Information Administration shows we are producing about 11.6 million barrels a day, still below what we were doing two and a half years ago, but it's bouncing back, and drilling for oil and gas has gone up by 60% over the last year. Not that all of it stays here. We are a net exporter when it comes to petroleum in America, shipping out more to other countries than we bring in from other countries, to the tune of about 160,000 barrels a day, according to the U.S. Energy Information Association. So is it as simple as just saying, drill more? And whose job is it to make sure that happens? Is this a short-term solution, or is it even a long-term one? I guess, well, time will tell. Same story, just a different day. It's hot out there, and it's going to stay that way for a while. But we still have your questions about how to keep cool and where. You got a hot take? Send it to us. Text us now or pretty much anytime. 208-321-5614. That's the number. Send us your thoughts on the show, your story ideas, a picture of your last Google search. On second thought, keep that one. But do include your name and the hashtag, the 208. We're going to share some of your messages at the end of the show. But if we miss yours today, don't worry. There's always a chance we could use it tomorrow.
All right, if that seven day forecast holds true, that would make seven days in a row we're in store for when it comes to triple digit temperatures. So it's going to be hot and keeping cool is still on the minds of a lot of people out there. Yesterday we updated you on the status of two city pools across the area, both of which won't be open until at least next summer. So no relief there. But more questions keep coming in about local pools like this one from Bruce in Boise. How about an update on the new pool in Boise, specifically the pool under construction on Finley Avenue? Thanks, he says. Well, you're welcome. Let's get to that. That's the Greater Boise Aquatic Center near Federal Way. It broke ground just last June, and this is what it looks like 13 months after that groundbreaking. It's supposed to be a state of the art center that says it will meet the needs of recreational, competitive, social and therapeutic members of all ages and abilities. So they got the roof going right now, which is good shade for the workers, right? It's going to have an eight lane 50 meter lap pool and a separate six lane 25 yard pool with other amenities like locker rooms and concession areas. Pools are set to be installed next month. Wow. They also say their goal is to be in place, a place that is for everyone young and old to learn to swim. So when can we expect that center to open? Big question. They say if everything stays on schedule, they plan to open in February, just in time for winter. All right, final minute or so of the show. Let's get to your text messages you sent in today, like this one here from Steve. I can understand the oil companies not wanting to develop new resources. Why invest billions when the Biden administration wants to reduce oil consumption? I guess there's only a limited supply out there anyway, so any sort of movement will be answered here shortly. Joe Biden campaigned on an anti-oil stance. He canceled Keystone, increased taxes on leases, and has done everything he can to destroy the industry. Where's the green alternatives, asks Mike. 
Well, how about this one? You don't just drastically move away from fossil fuel until the alternative is ready to go. Your transition slowly, not drastically, as has happened, says Tom and Boyce. So, yeah, it's kind of a balancing act here. We're trying to move away from fossil fuels so we don't have to rely so much on it, but we also have to upgrade our infrastructure to handle alternatives. Regarding inflation story, I worked for a worldwide food company in senior management. The corporate motto when we saw a chance to increase margins, never let a disaster go to waste. Prices were raised for no other reason than for profit, says John. I'm a state employee and I work my <clears throat> and don't even make 60000 These people don't do anything and this woman makes 77000 How can this even be allowed? What a complete joke, says JP. I just looked up cronyism in the dictionary and there was a picture of McGeehan. So much appreciate your reporting about her nefarious antics. Finally, can someone make sure Janice doesn't take the stapler and trash can when she leaves office for good, says Mark. We'll see you tomorrow.